All right, welcome to the webinar at the intersection of climate and poverty, solutions to advance planetary and human well-being. We're hosted by the Return Peace Corps Volunteers for Environmental Action, the Global Allied Partners Ending Poverty with Results, and Project Drawdown. My name is Kate Schachter. I'm president of the Environmental Action Group. I served as in Peace Corps in Ghana from 2004 to 2007 and in Georgia from 2016 to 2017. I currently work as the University of Wisconsin-Madison Campus Peace Corps recruiter. So our mission in the Environmental Action Group is to engage the Peace Corps community of returned volunteers, families, friends, and allies to take action on critical issues of climate change and environmental issues. We recognize power in coalitions and seek to partner with individuals and groups like GAP and Project Drawdown Tonight, who are focused on the ways that climate change intersects with social issues. Thank you to our speakers, Carissa patron McCurry, the program coordinator for Drawdown Lift with Project Drawdown, Kul Chandra Gautam, former UNICEF Deputy Executive Director and United Nations Assistant Secretary General, and Neil Boyer, Peace Corps Program Specialist for the Environment. I also want to recognize the planning team, Ken Patterson of Results, Meredith Miller-Vostre of the RPCVs for Environmental Action, and Karen Burry of GAP, Ending Poverty with Results. And now, allow me to pass you on to Ken Patterson, Director of Grassroots Initiatives at Results, who will be our moderator this evening. To you, Ken. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, as Kate noted, I'm Ken Patterson, and I'm here on behalf of Results, a constituent advocacy organization working to end poverty in the US and globally. I'm also here representing the National Peace Corps Association affiliate group, the Global Allies Program, Partners Ending Poverty with Results. Our affiliate group focuses on ending global poverty by engaging return Peace Corps volunteers and others in shaping US government policies around health, education, and economic opportunity. Again, thanks again for joining at the intersection of climate and poverty, solutions to advance planetary and human well-being. The subject of this webinar is extremely timely given the challenge we've, challenges we've seen um, in global development over the past couple of years due to COVID, and conflict, and climate change. And over the next hour, we're gonna highlight some of the current problems we're facing around the world on climate and poverty. But the biggest focus is gonna be on the solutions. Grounded in research conducted by Project Drawdown, we're gonna see that we can support global development in low income settings, while at the same time reducing climate change threat. Um, and that sounds pretty hopeful, doesn't it? This is all what we wanna be doing. And hopefully this is what you wanna to hear tonight. So we have three great panelists with us here tonight to, to explore the intersection of climate and poverty. So first we have Carissa Patron Mekuri. She is the program coordinator with Project Drawdown, the newest program of, uh, she's uh, sorry, with coordinator with Project Drawdown Lift. That's the newest program of Project Drawdown that works to um, deepen collective understanding of the links between climate change solutions and poverty alleviation, particularly in low and middle income countries. She has over 10 years of experience in community-driven development, sustainability, equity, and climate change. She was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nicaragua and has a Master of Public Health degree with an emphasis on nonprofit management and leadership. Kul Chandra Gautam is a distinguished diplomat and development professional. He's a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF and has managerial and leadership career experience with the United Nations spanning over three decades. Kuhl was the key senior UNICEF officer responsible for drafting the declaration and plan of action of the 1990 World Summit for Children, the largest gathering of world leaders in history until that time. The Summit for Children gave a major boost to the near universal ratification of the Convention of the Human Rights of the Child. The ambitious goals and targets initially formulated by the summit eventually evolved into the Millennium Development Goals. Kuhl is a citizen of Nepal and he currently serves as an informal advisor to his country's political and civil society leadership on democracy, human rights, and socioeconomic development. 
Uh, among the many awards Cool has received, he is proud to have been awarded the National Peace Corps Association's 2018 um, Harris Wofford Global Citizen Award. And then we have Neil Boyer. He is environmental specialist for the Peace Corps Office of Overseas Program uh, and Training Support, OTAPS for any return Peace Corps volunteers. Um, his work at the Peace Corps is focused on climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and integrating poverty, equity, and inclusion considerations into Peace Corps environmental programming. Neil has more than a decade of professional international development experience in, the, in West and South Africa, serving with the Peace Corps in Burkina Faso and Lesotho, USAID as an economist in South Africa, and with the United Nations Development Program in the Gambia, Swaziland, and Namibia. He's also worked for Africare and consulted for the UN and Agricultural Organization. Neil also has an uh, academic career, including teaching at, uh, African studies at Northeastern University, agribusiness and ec economics at South Carolina State University, and development studies at the University of Sussex. So I wanna thank and welcome Carissa Cool and Neil for joining us this evening. Um, so we're gonna get started. Um, first, poverty and in inequity and climate change are some of the most pressing issues of our time. And it, it begs the question, can we address climate change and improve the well-being of people experiencing extreme poverty at the same time? The answer, as we're going to see tonight, is, is yes. But it's particularly urgent to implement complementary approaches now because low- and middle-income countries are historically the lowest greenhouse gas emitters, yes, they're, yet they're disproportionately impacted by climate change, poverty, and food insecurity, among other inequities. In late March of this year, Project Draw Drawdown published a landmark report, Climate Poverty Connections, Opportunities for Synergistic Solutions at the Intersection of Planetary and Human Well-Being. The report identifies human well-being co-benefits from 28 uh, climate solutions falling into five themes. Today, we're gonna explore two of those five themes embedded in the report. And to start our session with that, Carissa is going to share some key takeaways from the report, and then we're gonna have a panel discussion with our speakers. So Carissa, are you ready for us to get, get going on this? Yep, let me just share my screen and we'll be good to go. Uh, can everyone give me a thumbs up if you could see what I'm sharing? Thanks. So thanks again, Ken. I'm Chris and I work with Project Drawdown. I am the program coordinator for the Drawdown Lift program, which is our newest program focuses, that focuses on the intersections between climate change solutions and human well-being, particularly poverty alleviation. So as Ken had mentioned, I served in the Peace Corps in Nicaragua from 2013 to 2015 teaching English in two rural high schools. And I'm really privileged to be here alongside Cool and Neil tonight and just sharing a little bit about our research, but also having a discussion with you all moving forward. So first I'd like to kick us off with a brief poll. So if Karen, you could share the poll. Um, Basically the question is what percentage of cumulative carbon dioxide emissions have come from Africa? 1%, 3%, 10%, or 15%. So that's from industrial times up until 2020. So I'll give it a second to populate. So it seems to be about 50-50, tied with 1% and 3%. So around half of you were correct, with it being 3% of cumulative carbon dioxide emissions. So in comparison, the U.S. has contributed around 29% of cumulative CO2 emissions, and that's something that we'll dive into a little bit deeper. Just when it comes to the vast inequities of not only contributions to climate change, but also um, the disproportionate impacts as well. So moving on, what is Drawdown? So it's in the title of our organization, but Drawdown really refers to the point and moment in time when levels of greenhouse gas emissions start to peak and fall. So this would be a milestone in reversing 
climate change and also reducing global average temperatures. So the mission of Project Drawdown is to help the world reach Drawdown as quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. So we are a US-based nonprofit organization that focuses on climate research and communications. We're best known for the best-selling book Drawdown, which was updated in 2020 with the Drawdown Review. So we are a leading resource on both climate solutions and strategies. So we have a large amount of climate solutions, there are over 90 of them that we have analyzed in the system of solutions. So ranging from reducing food waste to shifting to clean energy, all of the solutions are very interconnected and we need every single one of them to be able to reach drawdown. So the solutions that we analyze are currently available, financially viable, proven, have proven potential to reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and also have significant or sufficient data to model how much greenhouse gases can be either mitigated, reduced, or sequestered. And so generally there are a few different sectors of um, that produce greenhouse gases for the most part, which these are the five sectors, electricity production, food, agriculture, land use, industry, transportation, and buildings make up 90% of um, greenhouse gas sources and Project Drawdown aims to really tackle greenhouse gas sources in all of those different sectors. So when it comes to the framework of how we are able to analyze these solutions, we really focus in three key areas. So sources, sinks, and societies. And when it comes to sources, we can start by reducing the sources of greenhouse gases by really shifting electricity production, increasing energy efficiency, and shifting diets, etc. We can then also support and enhance natural sinks that remove carbon dioxide emissions from the atmosphere, for example, by improving agricultural practices and protecting and restoring ecosystems. So the third part of this framework is to really address inequities that we see in society to really achieve that broader transformation through people-centered solutions. So health and education, which I'll do a little bit of a deeper dive into later, is one of those solutions. So taken together, these are solutions that we must pursue both individually and globally. So doing a little bit of a deeper dive into Drawdown Lift, as Ken had mentioned, we really focus on the connection between climate change and poverty. They're inextricably linked in every way. And people experiencing extreme poverty, particularly women and children, are more vulnerable to natural disasters and commonly live in regions that are, have been and are, will, are projected to be more impacted by climate change. So our work at Drawdown Lift is really to deepen the connect, collective understanding between climate change solutions and poverty alleviation, particularly in rural communities in Africa and South Asia. So while Project Drawdown Solutions are mitigation focused solutions or reducing emissions focused. The subset of solutions that we focus on really have multiple benefits, not only for climate mitigation, but also adaptation and resilience as well. So in order to frame this conversation, I wanna make sure that we are understanding that the impacts of climate change vary enormously across countries and different social groups, particular because, particularly to systems of oppression. So colonialism, capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, the list goes on. We recognize that rural communities in Africa and South Asia are often first and worst impacted by climate change, yet have contributed the least to the problem, as we saw in the poll. So women, people experiencing poverty, um, socially disadvantaged groups, ethnic minority, persons with disabilities are often most vulnerable to climate change but that's because of their systemic inclusion from economic, educational, and social systems that are vital resources and opportunities to build capacity in order to adapt or build resilience to climate change. So climate change like poverty is often gendered, the adverse effects are often gendered and Climate-driven hazardous events also disproportionately affect women and exacerbate um, gender inequality, specifically in regards to 
education, reproductive health, and socioeconomic status. But even though women are, you know, a lot of what is talked about is how vulnerable women and children are, but it is equally as important to recognize that women are leaders in every space as well, especially within the climate movement. And it's important to understand that women must be able to fully participate in all spheres of life if we are able to reach drawdown at some point. So uh, last but not least, but children too are often the most impacted. For example, babies born in 2020 in Sub-Saharan Africa are projected to experience around six more times um, climate events than their you know, counterparts would have in the 1960s. So it's a very dramatic statistic, but I think it's really important to understand that we have to protect, protect our future generations and that action has to stem from what we can do now together. So as I had mentioned, Drawdown Lift focuses on 28 climate solutions out of the it's a subset of over 90 solutions that we have uh, within Project Drawdown. And we've broken down the solutions into five different subgroups. So improving agriculture and agroforestry, adopting clean cooking, fostering equality, protecting and restoring ecosystems and providing clean electricity. And this is done because we've grouped them in ways so that the human well-being benefits of those climate solutions are similar within each of these subgroups. So the gray bubbles represent the other project right on solutions that we don't focus on within LIFT for right now. So in order to assess the evidence of the five solution groups on the left-hand side, we looked at 12 different dimensions of human well-being. So it was really adapted from the donut economic framework, which really focuses on ensuring that people will are able to thrive while preserving the health of the envir environment as well. So we use the donut economics framework for three main reasons. One being its explicit inclusion of gender equality, two, its adaptability and flexibility, and then three, as a framework for us to be able to analyze the co-benefits of climate solutions in a scientifically consistent manner. So we reviewed over 450 peer reviewed articles that we have compiled in the Climate Poverty Report, which we can send you a link to shortly. But on the left hand side of this diagram, it shows all the different solutions groups and then how many greenhouse gas emissions could be reduced or sequestered within on a global level. And today we'll be focusing on the improving agriculture and agroforestry clim climate solution group and fostering equality as well. So you can see from left to right, there are direct benefits in blue and then indirect benefits in gray. And the stronger the um, human well-being co-benefits that we've seen that are have more evidence and are stronger are falling on the left-hand side. And then you can see them um, increase from there. So moving on to do a little bit of a deeper dive into agriculture and agroforestry, specifically because a lot of, you know, both of the groups that we are, you know, speaking with today are really focused on food and um, general equity as well. It's really important to focus on agriculture. So changing the way that we grow food is really critical for addressing climate change in every way. Our analysis suggests that improving agricultural practices can reduce emissions of about nine gigatons per year. And to really put that into context, the annual global greenhouse gas emissions in 2020 were approximately 50 gigatons. So there's a huge potential for action there. Um, improving agricultural productivity is really a key pathway for eliminating poverty, especially with a lot of smallholder farmers. And one third of the population, around 2.3 billion people, um, experienced moderate or severe food insecurity in 2020. And globally, food insecurity among women is 10% higher than that of men. And obviously, the war in Ukraine and recent heat waves and other climate disasters around the world have really further increased food insecurity in many countries that are dependent on wheat and fertilizers imported from Ukraine as well. So 
Also, just in, in addition, World Bank economists estimate that improvements in agriculture are actually 11 times more effective at reducing extreme poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa than investments in any other sector. So this systems diagram kind of shows where, you know, the intersections between the climate solutions and then the human well-being benefits on the right. Those in the dark gray line are those direct co-benefits, and then it shows the indirect co-benefits that come from those direct co-benefits as well. And, um, you know, it shows how some co-benefits can um, enable other co-benefits, and then those ripple effects too um, also come from those indirect co-benefits as well. So for example, solutions like sustainable intensification for smallholders and multi-strata agroforestry that you can see on the left can yield higher yields and boost food security and increase income, which can also provide a buffer against extreme climate events. An increase in household income could be used to purchase cleaner energy or a mobile phone that could either help to reduce food waste or improve access to better markets. And then food insecurity and increase in income can then contribute to better health and gender equality, and then maybe provide some improvements in social equity and peace and justice, which has really long-term benefits for a country. Um, even though land tenure is in the kind of ecosystem solution group, I think it's really important to highlight here that 85% of women in the world um, or in low and middle income countries lack the right to own land, but they make up around 40% of agricultural workers um, in low and middle income countries. So, you know, women's and indigenous people secure land tenure are super important and able to, you know, improve food security, have better practices when it comes to water, reduce gender-based violence, and the list goes on. So there's evidence that, you know, women secure land tenure can lead to all of these points shown, including income changes and also reduce gender-based violence, increase women, women's agency, and higher adoption of conservation practices. So shifting gears a little bit to Fostering Equality, the solution group that focuses on voluntary rights-based family planning and universal, universal high-quality education. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, around 30% or almost 100 million children and adolescents do not attend school today, primary or secondary school. And in Asia, that's around 20%. So it's crucial, it's a, hu a basic human right that can be really transformational, um, not only for climate, but for leadership and, um, you know, boosting human well-being as well. So to be clear, family planning and ensuring everyone's, con you know, contraceptive needs are met in a way that centers bodily autonomy is not in of itself a climate mitigation solution, but rather it's an outcome of family planning and people's right to choose when, whether, and with whom to have a child could result in slower population growth, which is a climate solution that is embedded in our modeling. Um, so, one last point to mention about uh, education specifically is that three quarters of children who never enter primary school are girls from rural and under-resourced communities. So again, it's really important to just recognize the deep inequities within our systems to be able to come together and really act on climate in a way that is holistic and inclusive. Um, so this is just another systems model that shows um, just the direct and indirect benefits. And you can see that on the right-hand side, there are no ripple effects. They're all direct and indirect co-benefits. Um, and this is the only solutions group that has clear co-benefits for all 12 of the dimensions of human well-being. And um, health and education is really crucial for you know, the well-being of people, but also of the planet. So the solution really, or the solution in the solution group, which is only one solution, generates substantial direct benefits for health and education, income and work, food and gender equality, 
but then also has those indirect benefits that can really transform society as well. So through our thorough review process, we've found solid and substantial evidence of the 28 different climate solutions that generate really significant direct and indirect benefits of human well-being, particularly around income and work, health, food security, education, gender equality, and energy. And together, those 28 solutions, part of those five different solution groups, can reduce around 900 or 690 gigatons between 2020 and 2050. And imp improving the human well being of people experiencing extreme poverty and addressing climate change can and must be done together and must be complementary. And we are eager really for this report and information to be shared and used not only by decision makers and policymakers, but individuals to further your education on climate change solutions and really, you know, not just reside in kind of like the doom and gloom and what we usually see in the news, but recognize that we have solutions at hand and it's imperative to really be able to further the, hum the well-being both of humans and our planet to be able to do that together. So um, with that, I will pass it back to you, Ken. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Carissa. Um, you really did a great job at laying out the context for our conversation tonight. Um, so let's hear from our other panelists. My name is Sam Root. We're going to see if we have some time to answer some of your questions. So if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the chat for us. But um, let's go ahead and get started and talk a little bit about how these issues are showing up in the world from your experience. Um, let's start with Cool. And um, Cool, what impacts of climate change are you seeing in your home country of Nepal or other countries that you are aware of? Well, thank you, Ken. And before answering your question, let me first start with congratulating the Project Drawdown and Lift for this excellent report. I think the take home message as uh, Carissa explained so eloquently is that the climate crisis and the poverty crisis can be tackled simultaneously and synergistically. And that is my experience too, based on my long experience at the United Nations with UNICEF, with results, with the Peace Corps all over the world. Now coming to uh, your question about the impact of the climate crisis in countries like Nepal, uh, let me say this. As you can see in the background to my picture here, Nepal has those beautiful, majestic, the highest mountains in the world, the Himalayas. And in my childhood, every morning when I woke up, I used to see those beautiful mountains, no longer. Why? Because the mountains have become invisible most of the time because they are covered with haze and smog and black carbon, at least from my village. The Himalayas are the third largest uh, storage of frozen water in the world. The first one is the, Atlant uh, the Antarctica. The second one is the Arctic, also called the North Pole and the South Pole. And the Himalayan are called the Third Pole. And the rivers that flow from the Himalayas are the source of fresh water for one billion people, stretching all the way from Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Burma, and China. That is why the Himalayas are also known as the water towers of Asia. In the past couple of decades, because of global warming, the snow and ice in the Himalayas are melting rapidly and the amount of frozen water is decreasing. It's interesting to note that warming seems to increase with altitude. So even if the global temperature was maintained at 1.5 degrees Celsius on average, in the Himalayas, it would rise to 1.8 degrees. Such temperature rise is already causing devastation. Glaciers are melting and forming huge glacier lakes. As temperatures rise, those lakes burst and cause huge floods and landslides downstream. Because of global warming, the whole environmental balance that has been maintained for thousands of years is now changing. The weather patterns are changing. 
unseasonal rains are impacting agriculture, forestry, the flora and fauna all over the Himalayan region. You know, historically, human settlements and human civilization actually grew mostly in river beds and river, river valleys with massive floods and landslides caused by glaciers melting and unseasonal rains. Many villages, towns, and cities along the river banks and the river uh, valleys are likely to be swept away. This is not a theoretical possibility. It's actually happening. Last year in Nepal, we had terrible floods and landslides. Several villages were swept away a 20 kilometer stretch of road and 18 bridges were completely destroyed and several hydroelectric dams were totally damaged you know, costing over a hundred million dollars. This is just one small example from one country in, at one time, but many more such devastating events are happening and frequency of such events is accelerating. If current warming trends continue, we expect that by the end of the century, two thirds of the Himalayan glaciers will melt. And even if global temperatures rise is maintained within 1.5 degrees, one third of glaciers will melt and burst, hugely impacting the lives and livelihoods of millions, tens of millions of people. Hence, mitigation as well as adaptation to the inevitable climate change is absolutely key. Policymakers need to understand what's likely to happen a few years and a few decades ahead, uh, ahead of now. We need to change settlement patterns, agriculture practices, and how bridges and roads and infrastructure are built to avoid them being swept away by floods and landslides. And let me add that the recommendations contained in the drawdown lift report actually offer some of the solutions for countries like Nepal and the whole Himalayan region. Thank you. Thanks very much for that cool, really insightful um, thoughts and, and really some devastating comments about what's going on. Um, Neil, I wanna ask you a similar question. What impacts of climate change are you seeing in countries where the Peace Corps is serving right now? Thank you. And first of all, Carissa, thank you for the presentation and thank you for elaborating on the linkages between poverty and climate change. At Peace Corps, you know, we serve communities in over 50 countries in Europe, Africa, the Americas, and Asia. And in all of these communities, we are witnessing firsthand the traumatic and devastating consequences of climate change. As Carissa identified in her slide, a climate change which could have been and should have been avoided. We are seeing an increase in climate change associated shocks, more intense cyclones in Mozambique, flooding in Senegal and Paraguay, um, collapse of the Greenland ice cap and sea level rises, which are affecting many of the island nations, you know, that host Peace Corps volunteers. And we're seeing long-term stresses such as drought in Ethiopia, heat waves in China, et cetera. Now, what are the consequences of all these shocks and stresses that we're seeing? We're seeing increased rural out migration associated with instability in maintaining livelihoods from agriculture, animal husbandry, and accelerated population movements to urban and peri-urban areas. Um, we're seeing that happening in the Sahel. We're seeing the migrations of people leaving Central America coming to the Southern border. And associated with those population movements and as people adapt, we're also seeing, unfortunately, rising gender inequality. More girls unable to attend school or complete school, increases in sexual violence and exploitation. And we're seeing climate change act as an additional trigger for resource-based conflict, intensifying hardships for households and communities across the globe. And you know, from a Peace Corps perspective, it places further limitations on where we can safely post our volunteers. So when people talk about climate change as in 2030 to 2035, at Peace Corps, we're seeing the effects on the, in the communities that we serve throughout the world. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, I appreciate that uh, thought. And 
And um, speaking of uh, gender equity or gender equality, which you, you touched on there, Neil, um, cool. Could you say a little bit about why why is it critical, um, you know, gender equity, gender equality, why is that critical to environmental and climate solutions? And how does fostering equity address multiple challenges, including things like food and nutrition, as well as climate? Well, Ken, gender equality is critical to tackling the climate crisis because, as Carissa said, climate crisis is not gender neutral. Girls and women experience the greatest impact of the climate change because it exacerbates the already existing gender inequality and it poses unique threats to their livelihoods, health and safety of women and girls. Across the world, but particularly in low and middle income countries, women bear disproportionate responsibility to secure food, water and fuel. And women need to work harder to secure income and resources for their families, especially during periods of natural disasters and the climate crisis. Also, this puts an added pressure, particularly on girls who often drop out of school to help their mothers. As climate change drives conflict, women and girls face increased vulnerabilities to all forms of gender-based violence. As, as Neil said, including sexual violence, human trafficking, early child marriage. During humanitarian crisis, women and girls are less able to access humanitarian assistance, further threatening their livelihoods and well-being and recovery. And the research indicates that climate-induced disasters greatly endanger women's health by limiting their access to healthcare services that leads to increased risk of maternal and child health and the spread of waterborne diseases also happen. On the other hand, on the positive side, women are powerful agents of change in protecting the environment and promoting human development. As many studies have shown, investment in girls' education and health is the best way to combat intergenerational transmission of poverty. An educated girl marries later, has fewer and healthier children, whose daughters are more likely to go to school and complete school. They get better paying jobs, exercise leadership role in their community, and thereby contributing to the ending of poverty, the cycle of poverty. So empowering women creates a virtuous cycle of, of protecting the environment, as well as tackling the issues of poverty, illiteracy, malnutrition, uh, as women are amazing agents of change. Thank you. Thanks for that, Cool. That's, that's great. Um, and again, it, it's a, a critical part of the report that Carissa talked about earlier, girls' education. We'll get a chance to take an action on that later tonight. I want to come back to Neil here. Um, Neil, so how is the Peace Corps been working at the intersection of climate and poverty? And then how, how do you think that uh, the Peace Corps might use or apply some of the information from the report for volunteers in the field? Uh, or maybe even return Peace Corps volunteers. Thank you. I mean, um, for Peace Corps, we have six thematic areas. I mean, from, since many of you um, either have worked with Peace Corps or were volunteers, as you know, we have education, we have agriculture, we have environment, we have community and economic development, health and youth development. And these areas also correspond to goals one to five of the SDGs, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals, also called the Global Goals. You know, the first of the SDGs, SDG one is, you know, entitled End Poverty, and it's also heavily influenced by the other SDGs. SDG two, End Hunger, SDG three, Health, SDG four, Education, SDG five, Gender Equality. And all of these interventions together aim to reduce multidimensional poverty, not just income poverty, especially in those marginalized and vulnerable communities most at risk from climate change. As human beings, all of our actions are dependent on the living environment. That means the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the ground where we walk. This living environment is under threat from environmental degradation and climate change. And just as an agency, we are committed to the implementation of SDG 13, 
which is called Take Urgent Action to Combat Climate Change and Its Impacts. For Peace Corps, what we've just developed is a performance goal on climate change within our fiscal year 22-26 strategic plan. And that's called Contribute to Host Country Efforts to Combat Climate Change and Its Impacts. And it basically means that we're working with host countries to help them implement their national adaptation plans. You know, because even if we attain the 1.5, as Gould has said, we still have these challenges and these shocks and these stresses that we're currently experiencing. So how do communities adapt? How do communities survive? And more importantly, how do communities become resilient? Now, when you talk about volunteers, one of the things that, you know, we train volunteers now is a tool called participatory action for community, excuse me, participatory analysis for community action or PACA. And we try to look at development through a human lens. So in this case, we're looking at climate change through a human end, through a human approach and through a gender lens. So we work with our national colleagues and host communities on a variety of climate change adaptation mechanisms, climate smart agriculture, inclusive disaster risk reduction and early warning systems. Our challenge is to integrate climate change into all our programmatic sectors. The intersectionality of these interventions promote multiple benefits. For example, in Panama um, and in Zambia, we are working on forest conservation, we're looking at energy consumption, and we're looking at health. In the case of Panama, we're linking adoption of approved cook stoves with reducing the risk of smoke-induced respiratory illnesses, which disproportionately affects women and girls. So we can look at promoting environmental action, you know, um, improving the use of cook stoves, which reduces fuel wood consumption, or look at alternative energy sources like, you know, biogas digesters. And not only does it have the impact of reducing forest deforestation, but it also has positive health outcomes as well. Thanks for that, Neil, I appreciate that. Um, let's, let's take a question from the audience here. Um, um, so what social norms, behaviors, et cetera, can help or hurt climate change? Um, for example, you know, uh, yeah, just let's leave it at that. What social norms or behaviors can help or hurt climate change? And then, and this is for anybody here in the panel. You know, when we talk about social norms, I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about behaviors and behaviors are learned and behaviors can be changed. And so, you know, one of the things, for example, you know, today we just um, put out a report, you know, on solid waste management, where as opposed to, you know, identifying, you know, why there were these problems, the first issue is, what are the barriers to changing these problems? Because you go into the assumption that people, they look at their communities and they see some of these challenges, but what are those factors which are preventing people from addressing these challenges? You know, I think um, Carissa talked about land tenure is one. If you're saying to someone, you should plant fruit trees because fruit trees, you know, will improve household nutrition. And you're saying to a woman, well, you have all this land, why don't you, you know, plant fruit trees? But then who has ownership of the fruit that those trees produce? And how is the income from the sale of the fruit coming from those trees going to help household, you know, food security, improve education, improve household health? And that's the ownership issue and that's a land tenure issue. And that changes with behavior. That's, that's great. Um, I'm going to ask one other question here, and then um, then I'm going to ask a question of all of you. So, if um, you know, in terms of like the behavior change piece, how do we go about you know engaging communities and the, those who are directly affected by these issues in the solutions themselves? And have you seen any good examples of that being done where folks are, you know, we're engaging the people in charge of their own development and, and their own lives and, 
in uh, in these kinds of solutions. Um, anybody on the panel want to talk about that? Can I share? Yeah. Can I share a, an example, particularly of when women are empowered? What dramatic changes can happen? Let me give you an example from Bangladesh. Many of us have heard about the microcredit schemes that has been so influential in reducing poverty in Bangladesh, because of which the Grameen Bank and its founder, Mohammed Yunus, got the Nobel Peace Prize. One of the lesser known elements of the microcredit in Bangladesh was a home improvement loan given to women. Now, uh, particularly in very poor areas that are also environmentally very fragile, subject to floods and fires, etc. The Grameen Bank said, we will help you improve your houses, we'll give you loans. But then they, it turned out that you know, they wanted to give the loans to women because women have the best record of paying back their loan and using the loan for the intended purposes. But it turned out that Houses and land are mostly, almost all of them are owned by men. They are, the title is in the name of men. So the Grameen Bank said, look, if you want this loan, you have to transfer the title to the women. So in the traditional society, many people did not want to do that, but a few brave souls agreed and transferred the title of the home to their wives. And they borrowed loans, home improvement loan, improved the houses, the houses were not only beautiful, sturdy, but they're also environmentally strong and resistant to, uh, to, to floods. Guess what happened? Many neighbors wanted to do the same thing. So quite a few people started transferring their title to their wives. So more and more women had ownership of the land and the house. And the whole power balance in the society changed. In the old age, whenever husband and wife had a quarrel, particularly in, in Bangladesh, in the Muslim community, it was easy to divorce for the men. You say, talak, 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 three times and you're divorced. And the man goes and marries another wife and throws out the old wound. But once the women had the right to property, they said, you want to divorce me? You get out of the house because the house belongs to me. And that led to tremendous changes in reduction in violence against children, against women, domestic violence. And many women empowered that way, started sending their girls to school and so on and so forth. And Bangladesh, as you know, today is one of the fastest growing economies, huge progress made. And just compare this thing. Bangladesh became independent 50 years ago from Pakistan. At that time, Pakistan was much better off in every indicator, economic, social, everything, than Bangladesh. Bangladesh was considered the basket case, as mentioned by Henry Kissinger. Today, compare the two countries. Primary school enrollment in Bangladesh, 100%. Pakistan, 56%. Female literacy, 73% in Bangladesh, 47% in Pakistan. Female life expectancy, 76 years in Bangladesh. 70 years in Pakistan. Under five mortality rate, 22 in Bangladesh, 57 in Pakistan. Gross national income, per capita income, 2,600 in Bangladesh, 1,500 in, 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 uh, in uh, Pakistan. All of that to show that it's the women's empowerment that led to this dramatic change. And we are seeing right now terrible floods happening in Pakistan. And Pakistan is having a great difficulty coping with this. Bangladesh is very prone to floods, huge floods every year. But Bangladesh manages uh, flood control much better than almost any other country. Why? Partly because of this empowerment of women, overall development has gone. So investing in women, empowerment of women, has the, is the magic formula in, in many ways to both tackle the climate crisis and to tackle poverty. And Ken, if I can just add to what Kul was saying yeah. as well, when we talk about engagement, I mean, you know, we often talk a lot about inclusion and 
you know, having historically marginalized groups, whether they be women, whether they be ethnic minorities, whether they be people with disabilities, having a seat at the table. That's very important, the, you know, representation, the diversity, but as important is also being able to have a voice that sets the agenda at that table. You know, um, who sets that agenda? You know, we're not just talking about diversity and inclusion or representation. We're talking about agency and equity. You know, so the move from being allies of women to being accomplices, because what we're, what we're talking about is fundamental human rights. And, you know, to have these same archaic, when we talk about behavior change, when we talk about these archaic relationships, you know, you know, we would say the idea that somebody can be a ruler just because of their bloodline. Many of us would say, well, how is that fair? How is that just? But what is the difference because one person has a penis, another person doesn't? We base the superiority on that kind of complex. So this is about behavioral change and this is about agency. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, and again, really powerful responses uh, from both of you in that last question. So this is our this is the last question. We're gonna try to put people in action tonight and give you some opportunities to do with the information, something with the information that you got here tonight. I, we could go on, there's a whole lot of stuff we could really uh, talk about around this subject. I wish we had more time. Um, last question here I wanna ask for all three of you actually is how do we as change makers, volunteers, return volunteers, advocates, practitioners, and others, how do we catalyze the kind of work and thinking needed to implement some of the solutions identified in this report? What, what, do we, what can we do around that? And again, just let's start maybe with Carissa. Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a few different thoughts to kind of unpack, but Predominantly with the report, our main messengers and kind of receivers of this information is geared toward policymakers and decision makers. So we have to look at this from not only a systemic level and poverty and or when it comes to policy and how yeah. systemically these needs to, these systems need to be put in place. If it's climate finance, there is a severe lack of finance when it comes to adaptation, and even more so when it comes to loss and damage that needs to be on the table for climate negotiations to be able to protect and support communities who continuously are more impacted by climate change but have contributed the least to it. But when it comes to an individual level, you kind of have to look at I like to call it your kind of individual knapsack of privileges and see what resources you have, who you're connected to, whether it's education that you have in that backpack of yours, or if it's money, or if it's connections, what is it that you can use to then just leverage what you have to be able to spread information about climate change, reframe the conversation from doom and gloom to a more optimistic, like solutions oriented narrative while recognizing that obviously there's a lot of space to be held for like the harm that has caused a lot of people regarding climate change. But it's kind of that balance between recognizing previous harms and addressing potential future harms. And that starts with not only individual action, but collective action in every way. Thanks for that, Carissa. Um, and let's let's hear from Cool and uh, Neil real quickly on your thoughts on like what so what's the best way to take this this information forward. Let's start with Cool. Well, I would say that this report contains a lot of excellent recommendations for advocacy with policymakers, experts, and development professionals. But this report could be further refined to be more useful for folks like the Peace Corps volunteers or grassroots activists who advocate at the local and community level. You know, when we say something like, the world is only spending $632 billion a year to tackle climate crisis, but it really needs $4.3 trillion. Figures like that turn people off. Most of us cannot deal with billions and trillions. We need to find ways to communicate 
in a way that ordinary people can relate and understand. We need some examples that say with so little investment, so much can be achieved. That with the present budget, we can do so much more if it were reallocated in the following way. We used to do that at UNICEF, where you know, Jim Grant, who was an amazing and charismatic leader, would go to world leaders and say, look, you know, for you, your political priorities are on prestige projects like building an airport or a highway or a football stadium, costing billions, millions of dollars. But for pennies, you can vaccinate children. You can you know, provide toilets to, you know, uh, separate toilets for girls for a hundred dollars. You can do, you know, instead of buying a, a helicopter for the governor, the same thing can provide school lunches for all the kids in your, in, your, in your province. So examples like that, ordinary people can relate to. I think if we did that, we would be able to convince many more people to become advocates for us. And let me say one final thing. This report is rightly focused on South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, because those are the you know, areas with the biggest uh, climate problems, although they contribute very little to global warming. But you know, if Americans are going to advocate for these policies, it's important that we should also be able to give some good practices from the US. And I would like to see that maybe in the next edition, Drawdown Lift might prepare a, a counterpart to this report that is applicable to the US. I live here in California right now, and I'm shocked. California is supposed to be among the most environment friendly states in the US, but lousy public transport. Why is there no bullet train from San Francisco to Los Angeles? Why are public buses so hopeless? Why do in, I, I'm in Orange County here and everybody drives their children to school. Hundreds of people every day, thousands of people. Why don't we have a few dozen school buses as all civilized countries in Europe and other, other places have? So a couple of those things, and those things can be done with existing budget. They don't require huge investment. Instead of building, spending billions on highways and maintaining them, why not build fast trains? energy efficient transportation. And I think we need to do some advocacy of that type here in the US so we can be more powerful when we advocate elsewhere. Because ultimately, com uh, combating climate crisis is going to require global solidarity. Solidarity requires shared values. We should be able to say that this is the same problem in America or in Africa or in Asia. We all need to tackle it. And we should start that with our children. School children here in the US and elsewhere should be able to say, we have this problem. This is how we are solving in our community. And this is how we would like to solve. We would like to help other countries to solve. I think that creates an environment for solidarity, which is the foundation, the fulcrum for us to be successful in tackling this huge problem of the climate crisis and poverty together. Thanks for that cool, some really powerful thoughts there. Neil, do you have a couple quick thoughts for us here to- Sure, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what Cool was saying. You know, people need to internalize climate change isn't somebody else's problem, it's not someplace else. It's here, it's dealing with it. We're seeing this climate migration, whether the fires in California or the flooding in the Gulf, et cetera. You know, for Peace Corps, when we train our volunteers, you know, using proper tools, Pocket tools are based on the five Ds. The one, you develop relationships. Two, you discover, you know, what is the problem? What are the challenges? Three, you kind of dream up with your colleagues, with your housemates, with your neighbors' solutions. You, you, know, you dream up these things, okay, you know, now we kind of have to make a plan, make a project, do something about it. And then we have to deliver it. And so in so much as when we talk about mobilizing, let me give you an example. So I'm not talking about abstract. I'm from Boston, I'm not from Washington. You know, just like many of you, I moved to Washington for work. But using Parker tools, you know, we developed a coalition to look at lead exposure and childhood asthma. 
And so currently we have 41 organizations, gender organizations, housing organizations, racial equity organizations, environmental organizations, health organizations coming together to say, why should we be drinking lead tainted water? Why should our children be at risk of asthma from housing asthma triggers like you know mold and mildew from methane gas, you know, from preferential air pollution. So you build these coalitions that Ken and Carissa started at the beginning. You know, we are all in this together. We will all swim together or we will sink together. And so as opposed to us being in our, okay, I'm in my environment silo. I'm in my gender equity silo. I'm in my racial justice silo. How do we cross these things so that we can all live together? Thanks for that, Neil. And, and again, a great examples of how we need to come together and work together for these things to, to work for all of us and look in our own backyards. And in your case, they're cool. So thank you very much for that. And it's a great example, Neil. So um, we're a little bit over time and I apologize for that. It was really hard to, to stop with all the great ideas flowing right tonight. And again, the chat has been really active and I really appreciate people's comments. So I wanna thank all of you for submitting questions and comments and for our speakers, for your real, real time and, and insightful thoughts. Um, we have a lot to think about, including how do we act? How do we take this and internalize it and put it into practice for ourselves tonight, which is a, a key thing that we wanna be able to take away. Um, so we want to get you started tonight by um, it, it, on that part of things on taking action. A couple concrete, concrete things you can do tonight, today, and tomorrow, and then um, ways that you can get involved in sort of maybe a on, more ongoing way in either uh, poverty or climate work. So um, for the first thing here, um, girls' education has um, has taken a huge hit during COVID, with millions of girls unable to go to school. Uh, increased child labor, early, early forced marriage and all. And we heard tonight about how important fostering, fostering equity and quality um, are in the solutions to, to, to climate as well. And so um, Results is working on a, a global education bill. It's the Read Act reauthorization bill. Um, we can, you can take um, action on that tonight by asking your um, and thanks somebody else put the link in there tonight on this by asking your senators to co-sponsor this bill. The bill focuses on USAID's global education policy on reaching the most marginalized and low income countries and removing barriers for girls education. So I encourage you to take that action tonight. This is something you can do tonight um, based on what we've said. Kate, I want you to talk a little bit about, tell folks about the, the letter to the editor writing workshop that's coming up, I think tomorrow. You there, Kate? I'm here. Thank Great. you very much. Um, Dylan Henson is a member of our RPCVs for Environmental Action. He has a monthly LTE action team, um, second Tuesdays of every month. And tomorrow night, he'll be walking you through writing a letter to your local paper, how to find out how to do that if you, if you don't already know and address an issue that resonated with you during this event. It could be any one of a number of different things. It's not focused just on one particular thing, but that intersection of climate and poverty. Over a hundred LTEs have been published nationwide in the past year through his efforts, through his um, uh, uh, regular meetings. From the New York Times to the West Virginia Journal, yours could be next. That's great, Kate, thanks for that. And then other things you can do is get out and vote um, in November and get others to vote. Consider becoming an advocate with one of the National Peace Corps Association affiliate groups that presented tonight. Um, I also encourage you to, to take some uh, uh, personal actions um, on uh, climate change. And I'm gonna put a link in the chat here that uh, Chris has shared with me earlier, some things you can do there. Um, and then I'm gonna hand this over to Kate to really close this out for the night. I do wanna make sure though, before I do that, let's let's um, allow, well, Kate, I'll let you do your part. And then I wanna make sure we give uh, folks a chance to applaud our, our guests and we'll give them a chance to unmute themselves at the very, very end. So okay. okay, all right. Yeah, thank you so much, Ken. And also to our speakers for sharing your expertise and special insight into the issues of 
climate change and poverty, Carissa's compelling report from Project Drawdown, Kul Chandra Gautam and his international perspective, as well as backyard perspective in California, and Neil Boyer with his special insight into the global impact of environmental justice, Peace Corps, and the environment and climate work that is underway. Ken, your smooth guidance of the discussion was spot on. As we wrap up our event, uh, we hope everyone here today leaves here inspired and reinvigorated to keep advancing climate solutions that can contribute to boosting human well being and alleviating poverty. To our audience who are P RPCVs, consider joining the RPCVs for Environmental Action or GAP, Global App Allied Part Partners, with results. To anyone who is not an RPCV and wants to network with action groups, we recommend results to keep you engaged in advocating for poverty, health, and food security issues. If your focus is on climate change and the environment, look to your local communities for, for organizations such as Citizens Climate Lobby, 350.org, Sierra Club, and so many more. Look for groups that are well-established, reputable, and solutions-oriented. Get involved. We appreciate especially all of the attendees who joined us today. We will send you a follow-up email when the recording is ready and up on our YouTube channel. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Kate. I, everybody, you can all unmute yourselves as well right now and give an applause to our uh, panelists. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. And thank you, Cool. Thank you, Neil. And thank you, Chris. Bravo. Uh, okay. Great. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Thank you. Bye, everyone.